and um, the, the, what we're going to do today is look at the Christmas story from the uh, perspective of the nativity scene. How many of you have a nativity scene at your house of some kind? A lot of people do. Um, we have a lot at our house. Uh, nativities are kind of our deal, uh, at least our Christmas deal. We have several of them. Um, I don't know how we got into them, um, but this is a picture. We, we have several all over the place, actually. This is, a, this is our first, well, probably not our first nativity, but this one we got in Israel when we were there in 2007. It's made of olive wood, and I remember being at this little shop, and there was all kinds of olive wood, like statues and trinkets and things like that. And we saw this nativity scene, and it was, it was very, very fragile, by the way. And so we're like thinking, okay, how are we going to get this home? You know, we're thousands of miles away from home. Do we ship it? Do we put it in our bag? It was just kind of chaos, I remember. And uh, actually, the star, if you turn it, it sings a song. So it's kind of like a music box and stuff. So it's, it's really special to us, that nativity. Um, and then uh, we also have a nativity um, that Lori got a few years ago. The thing probably cost more than my truck, I believe. <laughs> Um, it's will, willow, willow tree. Yeah, dude, those things are pricey. Uh, yeah, that thing is like, it's like 10 grand, just that thing by itself. No, it's not that much. But, you know, so we have that one. Um, and then two years ago, I decided, because I always put up a lot of Christmas lights. And for years, we've had the little uh, baby Jesus and, J and uh, Joseph and Mary, the little light up, you know, the blow up ones. Uh, well, not blow up, but they're blow mold is what they're called, plastic. And then I said, two years ago, I said, we need the whole scene, dude, we need to. And so I started searching online, and I got the whole set. We've got the little, uh, you can't really tell. Uh, oh, yeah, I guess you can from back there. But we've got the donkey, right, and the sheep, and the cow, and there's a shepherd there, and, you yeah, know, there's Santa or whatever. But anyway, uh, Jesus and Joseph and Mary. The angel used to be up on the table, but she keeps taking a dive, and so we put her down low. We've got the three wise men and a camel. And so we've got the nativity set. If you drive by our house, you can see that. Um, you'll also probably see Santa taking a whiz, which is weird, but that's not what we're talking about today. Um, but then anyway, today I want to talk to you about this nativity set that I got as a gift last year um, from some friends of ours that live in San Diego. And this thing is called the Millennial Nativity Set. And um, it's actually called the Hipster Nativity Set. And um, we got it as our Christmas gift last year, and it was produced by a couple guys in San Diego um, who wanted to create a conversation piece. And honestly, it created a internet craze of people loving it and hating it. Um, there's really, normally, if you're looking at it right now, some of you are like, I love it, and some of you are like, I hate it, uh, because it's irreverent or whatever. Um, and it has, if you look up, if you Google, like, nativity, uh, millennial nativity set, there are so many different uh, reactions to this. You know, uh, Catholic uh, priests who are, you know, praying condemnation over these guys to people that have embraced it and love it. And these guys, they're just trying to create a conversation piece. But we got this um, last year, and I have it. Actually, I, I brought it um, with me up here. You can't tell in the picture, but the barn has a solar panel on the top, which is cool. Um, the uh, three wise men are riding segways. Um, they have on skinny jeans, of course, and um, they have Amazon Prime boxes because the three wise men brought gifts, right? Um, Joseph and uh, Joseph has a man bun, which was cool last year. It's out this year, but uh, did any of you have a man bun? I think Stephen had a man bun, a mini bun, a mini man bun. He had one. Um, Joseph is taking a selfie. You can, you can see better actually up there. Joseph is taking a selfie of him and Mary and baby Jesus. Mary's got a cup of coffee. Um, the wise man is on, a, uh, on some kind of iPad or something with his earbuds in. And then if you can't see it, the cow is stamped 100% organic uh, beef. And then you can't really tell from the picture, but the feed that he's eating says gluten-free feed. So it's gluten-free. And then, of course, the sheep is wearing a, um, you know, a Christmas sweater. So there's lots of, you know, kind of current things that are happening in this set. And I don't show you the set to try to get your reaction one way or the other. But what I would like to do this morning is use the nativity set as a base for us to talk about the Christmas story. And, you know, whether you like that or hate it, 
really doesn't matter because ultimately it represents the Christmas story, which I pray that you love. I pray that you're here today for that Christmas story. And so um, because we're looking today at a modern, um, you know, a modern nativity set, I wanted for us to look at a modern Bible, a modern paraphrase of the Bible. And so we're going to look at the, the Christmas story through the message paraphrase, which um, is, a, is a more modern language, and, and we don't normally, you know, use the message in our studies here. Um, but I thought it would be it would be good for us to do that this morning to look at this story from um, the message point of view here. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to read the story. It's it's a lot of verses here, but we're going to work through it together. It says this, and so we're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to use the nativity scene <coughs> as this kind of a basis for us to look at these main characters in the story. Uh, we see the story of Jesus' birth in a few of the Gospels. We're going to look at it from the book of Luke. And then we're going to jump over to Matthew, both in chapter 2 of each, cha- of each book. So Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, says this about the time Caesar Augustus, and I just want to say I am not named after him. Everyone asks if my real name was Augustus. It is not. My real name was William, Okay. And so if you have a problem with that, you can talk to my mom in the back. It's her fault. But my real name was never Augustus. So anyway, about that time, Caesar Augustus ordered a census to be taken throughout the empire. Kids, a census was, you know, when uh, your teacher, when you go to class, I don't even know if they do this anymore. Do they, do they still take roll? Do you still do roll? So this was roll for adults, okay? It was like taking roll. Everyone's got to go to their homeroom and take roll, okay? <clears throat> Sorry. So it says... The first census was when Quirinius was governor of Assyria. Everyone had to travel to his own ancestral hometown to be accounted for. So they had to be counted. They had to go home. Uh, So Joseph went from the Galilean town of Nazareth up to Bethlehem. Remember, we we hear, we read about later in the story, Jesus of what? Nazareth. That's where he grew up, but he was born in Bethlehem. There's, there's, There's a twist to the story. Okay, so they went up from the town of Nazareth up to Bethlehem in Judah, David's town, for the census. As a descendant of David, he had to go there. So Joseph's great, 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 great granddaddy was David, King David. And that was David's town. Actually, Mary was great, 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 great granddaughter of, of David as well. So here we go. They had to go there. He went with Mary, his fiance. Who was pregnant? Okay, that's that's not good, right? We know this is not a good situation. You got a fiance pregnant. There's some sketchiness going on. Verse six. Here it goes. We'll continue. While they were there, so they went to Bethlehem. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. She gave birth to a son, her firstborn. She wrapped him in a blanket and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them. In the hostel, hostel's like a little hotel, okay? So it says, while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. She gave birth to a son, her firstborn. This is the first clear evidence of those people that believe the Virgin Mary stayed a virgin. Well, why would it say firstborn? We know that the scriptures tell us that Jesus had stepbrothers and sisters and fan and all this other stuff. But anyway, so this was her first. She wrapped him in a blanket and laid him in a manger. What's a manger? Somebody tell me. It's a feeding trough, okay? So they were in a cave. They were in a cave. We, we traditionally say that they were in some kind of barn or thing like this, but most likely, if you go to Israel and you look, they would have been in a cave, which is where the animals would have been sleeping and staying because there wasn't any room in the hotel. Verse 8, there were sheep herders camping in the neighborhood. And they'd set night watches over the sheep, so they had people in charge of watching the sheep. Suddenly, God's angels stood among them, and God's glory blazed around them, and they were terrified. I would be too. Imagine camping, and then all of a sudden, this huge, bright, shining light, and there's an angel standing there. You would be freaked out as well. They were terrified, and the angel said, don't be afraid. (laughs) Yeah, right, right? Like, come on. And they see, he says, I'm here to announce a great and joyful event that is meant for everybody worldwide. A Savior has just been born in David's town. A Savior who is Messiah and Master. When they heard that word, 
That was a key word for them. They had been hearing about the Messiah for hundreds of years. Well, these people weren't hundreds of years old, but their whole life, for generation upon generation upon generation, hearing about the Messiah who would come and save them. And now, it's announced that He's here. This is crazy. This is good. So this is what you're to do. To go and look for a baby wrapped in a blanket and lying in a manger. Verse 13. At once, the angel was joined by a huge angelic choir singing God's praises. So it wasn't just one angel. Now all of a sudden, there is a gigantic choir of angels. This is weird, okay? This is crazy. This is going to get your attention. This is not a dream. This is the real deal. Glory to God in the heavenly heights. Peace to all men and women on earth who please Him. As the angel choir withdrew into heaven, the sheep herders talked it over. They said, let's go over to Bethlehem as fast as we can and see for ourselves what God has revealed to us. So they say, the angel says, this is, the Messiah has been born. Let's go check it out. Let's go see if this angel's right. And they left running. 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 Okay, They left running and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger, seeing was believing. They told everyone they met what the angels had said about this child, and all who heard, all who heard the, sheep, the sheep herders were impressed. So they told everybody. They saw that what the angels had said was true. And so they tell everybody they know about it. And it's this amazing story that we celebrate today. Verse 19 and 20. Finishing this off, and Mary kept all these things to herself, holding them dear deep within herself. And the sheep herders returned and let loose. I love how he says it there. They let loose, glorifying and praising God for everything that they had heard and seen. It turned out exactly the way that they had been told. So Mary and Joseph are in Bethlehem. It's time for her. The baby, she has the baby. And then angels appear and tell the shepherds, go and check it out. And they do. The Messiah has been born, this promised Savior of the world that's been talked about and prophesied about for thousands of years is now here. This is what we celebrate today. What I want for us to do this morning is talk about kind of the characters. And of course, we're going to start with Mary and Joseph and the main character, baby Jesus. And um, as you can see, they are the center of the story. Jesus is the center of this story, of course. We see them here. If you don't know the backstory, and you're just catching up right now, the story has a little intrigue to it because it says that she's his fiance, but she's pregnant, right? So, you know, I'm looking around. I see most of you have grown up in church. Have, been to church for a long time, you know the backstory. If you were just to jump in this part of the story, you'd be like, whoa, this is, this is a little out of bounds here, right? This is a little crazy. She's engaged, but she's pregnant. That means they got the cart before the horse, or you know what I mean? Like they, they did some stuff in the wrong order. How is this in the Bible? Well, if you know a little bit about the backstory, you know that they're engaged, <coughs> and everything's going great. They're having a great old time, you know. It went back then when you were engaged, it was more than now. There was really no breaking off the engagement without some serious, you know, serious stuff happening. And then all of a sudden, Mary is just chilling out one day, and an angel shows up and says, Hey, yo, you're going to have a baby. And she's like, uh -uh, I'm a virgin. How's that going to happen? He's like, No, God is going to give you a baby, and it's going to be his baby. And she's like, uh, okay. Like, imagine, imagine singing in your living room with your Starbucks, you know, watching TV, and all of a sudden an angel shows up and, like, um, you're going to get pregnant, right? And it's going to be God's baby. Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. And you're like, what does that mean, right? Like, whoa, hold on, time out. It, but she wasn't like that. She was like, listen, I'm God's servant. Whatever God wants to do, I'm willing to be part of it. And so. She's impregnated by the Holy Spirit somehow. It's supernatural. It's a miracle that without being with Joseph, without being with a man, that God plants 
his son in her belly. Well, then, of course, she's got to tell Joseph, right? And Joseph's like, yeah, right, come on. Of course, like if you were engaged to a woman and she shows up pregnant, um, what are you going to do, right? You know it's not yours because you weren't in part of that, if you know what I mean. Like we got kids here, but, you know, like you weren't there. You weren't part of that story. And all of a sudden she's pregnant. So he decides, you know what, I love her, but she's lying about something or something. So he's going to quietly kind of disengage her and, and be done with it and move on and find an, a good girl. Well, the angel comes to him and says, hold up, bo- hold up, bro. You know, hold up. It's, it's God's baby. She's being truthful to you. She's telling the truth. And so he's like, okay, I get it. But they have to make a decision to move forward, knowing full well that there's going to be gossip and taking into consideration they're now supposed to parent the Savior of the world. How many of you want that parenting responsibility? Right? I mean, nah, nah. I mean, I got some good kids, but dude, come on. The Savior of the world? Mm. No thanks. Can you choose someone else, you know? And they went through with it. It says that they moved forward. So they got to go to Bethlehem for the census. It says, so Joseph went from Galilee and town of Nazareth up to Bethlehem and Judah, David's town for the census. Now, this is an important detail because hundreds and hundreds of years previous to this, prophets talked about the Savior being born in a little town called Bethlehem. How did they know? Well, God spoke to them. God said, write this down. Tell the nation of Israel that the Messiah will come from Bethlehem. And people are laughing. Bethlehem? Really? Come on. Come on, really? That's such a small... There's no way. There's no way. Look at what the prophecy said. Micah 5.2 says this, But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, Too little to be among the clans of Judah, for from you, one, with a capital O, one, the one, will go forth from me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from days of eternity. It's interesting, isn't it, that all of a sudden, Augie decides to have a census, and all of a sudden, uh, David's people, or Joseph and Mary, have to go to Bethlehem by chance, by random chance, this is just by chance that she ends up having the baby there. There was no chance. This was ordained in heaven centuries and centuries and centuries and centuries ago. While they were there, verse 6, while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to a son, her firstborn. She wrapped him in a blanket and, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for him in the hostel. So there's no room. In Bethlehem, it's a small town. Even if you go there today, it's still a small little town. Everyone that was from David's clan had to go there. And there was, there was no room in any of the hotels. Have you ever been to San Diego on the 4th of July? Raise your hand. Any of you ever gone to San Diego? Do any of you struggle to get a hotel room in San Diego? Like, try going there just without a reservation. I mean, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of hotel rooms in San Diego. You try to just drive over there that that day, right, for the fire, you are not staying. Because the city is jam-packed full of people that want to see the fireworks. It's really kind of the same scenario here. The city was jam-packed with people that lived in other places, but their family was from Bethlehem. And so there was no room for them anywhere. And so they stayed in a little cave. She says that she wraps baby Jesus in some cloths. She puts him in a cow or sheep or donkey feeder, something to feed animals with, assuming there's hay and things like that. We always think of a wooden trough. When you go to Israel, you learn that most likely that trough would have been made of stone. It would have been like a big stone with a kind of a a, a hollow piece kind of cut out of it, lays him on a big rock with maybe some hay and some 
blankets on top of him. There was no nurse. There was no emergency. There was no uh, labor and delivery nurses like we have in the front row here, right? Be awesome to have one of those there. Mm, probably not. No epidural, right? Uh, no golden fleece diapers. Um, none of that stuff. Just dirt and nastiness. Animals as your attendants, right? Um, this is kind of a crazy situation that happens here. It's crazy to think about what actually takes place. So we look at the next set of characters in the story, and that's the shepherds. Okay, the shepherds. This guy's got an iPad or some, some kind of gaming device. I don't know what it is. PSP or something. Well, it's a little handheld. I don't know. But anyway, um, so we, we look at the shepherds. The shepherds are freaked out when the angels come. And of course, you would be too. Imagine camping and all of a sudden, boom, you're just chilling in the desert and all of a sudden, bam, there are all of these angels singing and God's, it says God's glory. Now that's something nuts that you got. I can't even imagine that. And it's all happening right in front of them. Blazing lights and singing and all kinds of things happening there. Verses 8 through 12. There were shepherds camping in the neighborhood and they had set night watches over their sheep. Suddenly God's angels stood among them and God's glory blazed around them and they were terrified. The angel says, Go and check it out. It's true. The Messiah has been born. And they do so. And they realize this isn't a joke. This is the real deal. Messiah, they see, hey, I'm back on. They see the Savior of the world, that he's been born. And the news is too good to keep them quiet. And so they tell everybody they know about it. Now, what we're going to do is look at the wise men. And in, in our nativity scene here, the wise men um, are on segways. Have any of you ever ridden a segway? Anybody? A few of you. Or is it like the new hoverboards that are out? Is it's kind of have any of you ever read the new hoverboards that are out? A couple of you kids. So has anyone ever ridden a Segway and a hoverboard to tell me whether they're the same? I don't know. I kind of assume they're the same. Um, but anyway, so our in our nativity here, the wise men are riding Segways and they're bringing gifts. Amazon Prime. How many of you shopped Amazon Prime? Yeah, we man, Amazon's making a killing off the Clarksons. I guarantee you that. Um, but if we're going to look at the wise men because they were not recorded in the Luke account, we need to look to Matthew. So turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 2. The scripture is there. This is tricky. You know what? Can you run my PowerPoint or something for me when you see the slides? Just go. Or when I tell you to move because I can't. I don't got three hands. I know some of you do. Uh, you moms that have little kids have three hands, but I can't do this all together. So here we go. So move to chapter 2, verse 1. So this is the story of the wise men, or the magi, okay? It says this, it says, After Jesus was born, so this is after he's born, in the Bethlehem village, Judah's territory, this was during Herod's kinship. A band of scholars arrived from Jerusalem from the east, and they were asking around, where can we find and pay homage to the newborn king of the Jews? Now this was... A mistake okay this is a mistake on their part because if you know the rest of the story you know Herod was nuts 
and he ends up killing all of the little babies in Bethlehem because he didn't want anyone to take his throne. He was going to do whatever he could to keep his throne. So this was a bad thing that happens. Where can we find and pay homage to the newborn king of the Jews? We observed a star in the eastern sky that signaled his birth and were on pilgrimage to worship him. Verse 3, when the word of their inquiry got to Herod, he was terrified. And not Herod alone, but most of Jerusalem as well. Herod lost no time. He gathered all the high priests and religion scholars in the city together and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? And they told him, Bethlehem, Judah territory. The prophet Micah wrote about it plainly. It's you, Bethlehem, and Judah's land, no longer bringing up the rear. For you will come, from you that will come the leader who will shepherd, rule my people, my Israel. And Herod then arranged a secret meeting with the scholars from the east, pretending to be as devout as they were. And he got them to tell them exactly when the birth announcement star appeared. Then he told them the prophecy about Bethlehem. And he said, go and find this child, leave no stone unturned. And as you find him, send word and I will join you at once in your worship. So he's tricking them. He wants to find this babe and he wants to kill him. And so he sends these men on a mission. Verse 9, instructed by the king, they sent off. And then the star appeared again. The same star that they had seen in the eastern skies. And it led them until it hovered over the place of the child. They could hardly contain themselves. They were in the right place. They had arrived at the right time. They entered the house and saw the child in the arms of his mother. Overcome, they kneeled and they worshipped him. And they opened their luggage and presented gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And in a dream, they were warned not to report back to Herod. So they worked out another route left the territory without being seen and returned to their own country. So this star led these magi, these wise men, these scholars, this star led them to Jerusalem. You can advance. Thank you. Perfect. It leads them to Jerusalem. Well, they're in Jerusalem, but where is Jesus? Where's Jesus at this point? Where's baby Jesus? In Bethlehem. Well, from here, you're like, man, they, they went the wrong way. Well, Bethlehem's literally only like two miles away from Jerusalem. It's literally just up over the Mount of Olives. This is kind of cool. When you go to Israel, you get to see all of this stuff and how everything is connected. I mean, literally just have to walk over the Mount of Olives, and then they're in Bethlehem right there, very, very close, just a few miles away. They've come on a very long journey these wise men. And if you were here last year, we talked about the long journey that they went on. And traditionally, we, we, we say that there were how many wise men? Traditionally, we say that there were three, right? Because of songs and their names and songs and stuff. But last year, if you remember, we talked about how many there might have been. Probably hundreds of people that came along this journey Three very powerful, very rich men journeying for over a year, over, among nation, among nation, among nation to get there. They would have brought servants with them, people to set up their tent every night, people to cook for them, guards to protect them. There could easily have been over a hundred people in this caravan traveling from one part of the world to the next to worship this baby king. This was a huge step of faith for these magi. The only thing that we know for sure is that there was more than one because magi is plural. And we think, we always say that there's three, but really there were probably many more than that. And so they're in Jerusalem and they tell Herod, crazy Herod, about this star. And Herod, if you read the rest of the story, goes to Bethlehem, sends his men there, and kills all of, the, all of the male children two years and under to protect his throne. This is the horrible part of the story. But they arrive there. They arrive in Bethlehem, which is just a short distance, and they see him. 
they see what they've traveled so far, paid so much expense to come and worship. And they give him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, which were interesting gifts for a baby. But if you know who he grew up to be and what his future was, you know that these gifts had great significance for him. Gold for a king and frankincense and myrrh for someone who would be buried. We know that that's not the end of the story, though, that prayer, thankfully, he resurrected from that grave. So the question that I have for you this Christmas is, like, why is all of this stuff so important? Like, we read this story every year, and we talk about the details, and, like, why would I have four nativities at my house, right? Like, well, it's kind of overkill, first of all, right? But why is there even a nativity set at all? Like, why are the details of this Christmas story so important? Like, why are there lights and trees and gifts and songs and snowmen and all of these things? Like, this question, what's the big deal in all of it? The big deal is that tomorrow we celebrate the birth of our Savior. Amen? This is the celebration of the birth of our Savior. Now, I know some of you celebrate the birth of your kids and you go all out. I mean, I've been to some of your parties. You go all out. Kids like, you know, one years old, he ain't gonna remember nothing and you got the clowns and the jumpers and all of the, you know what I mean? Like, we ought to celebrate the birth of our Savior. This is something that is absolutely so important, which is why we have songs, which is why we have a month long of celebration. For us, Christmas starts the day after Thanksgiving. I know a lot of you it does too, uh, not because of Black Friday, but because that's when we start putting up our Christmas decorations because we can finally put them up. And so as we think about this for a second our savior jesus steps out of heaven where it was all about him right imagine heaven for a minute he steps out of heaven he's born into a no-name family in a no-name town surrounded by cow poo and whatever else takes on the life of a humble carpenter working with his hands lives a perfect life as an example for us to follow and then dies a horrible death and listen he didn't come I want you to hear me Jesus did not come to experience life on earth Jesus came for you to experience life in heaven. Let me say that again. Jesus did not come to experience life on earth. Jesus came so you could experience life in heaven. Amen? That's why we celebrate Christmas. That's why this day is so important. And I said it in my prayer before. Listen, Christmas is just the beginning of the story. It's the beginning of the story. And if there were no Easter, we wouldn't be celebrating Christmas. Okay? If there were no Easter, Jesus' birth would have just been like anyone else's birth. Okay? If there were no Easter, if there were no death, burial, and resurrection, then Jesus' birth would have just been, yeah, yeah, he was born, died just like the rest of us. So thank God for Easter, amen? Because there's an Easter, there's a Christmas. Think about that for a second. Because there's an Easter, there's a Christmas. Because there was a death, burial, and resurrection, we celebrate the birth of that person who was born and died and rose again. That's why Christmas is so important, because we celebrate the birth of our Savior tomorrow morning. So let's not get caught up 
and all the trees and the cookies. And by the way, those cookies were good, Debbie. Those were good, yeah. Um, but let's not get caught up in the presence and the lights and all of those things. Let's remember what we're here to celebrate, the birth of our Savior. And if he's not your Savior, I'm looking around, and I, you know, most of you, if Jesus isn't your Savior, if you've never received the gift of salvation, then that is the best gift you could ever receive in your entire life. Better than a thousand Xboxes. Better than a Corvette. Better than whatever it is that you want. The, the, the gift of salvation is the best gift that you can ever receive. And so I challenge you to receive that gift if you've never have. If you've never done that. So we're going to close. Yeah, because... CJ's ready to close. I know, we got a lot of kids in here. Um, so we're going to close, and here's how we're going to close. Um, kids, it's time for y'all to come forward. And for, yeah, y'all, I'm a cowboy today. Um, I'm going to close in a prayer, but I want, um, I want the kids to come up because we're going to sing Silent Night. We're going to turn out the lights. You're going to go up with uh, Miss Lori up onto the stage, but she's going to give you a candle before. Um, we kind of started a tradition here, I don't know, four years ago. Three years ago? I don't know. However long ago. A few years. We're just a baby church. So um, we're going to sing Silent Night together, and then we're going to close. And, and before we close, we're going to pray. And like I said, we're not going to receive an offering. We're going to pass boxes around. But if you've got an offering, you can put it in the back. Back there by all the T-shirts, there's a box kind of in the back. You can do that. Um, but I just wanted to say this. Thank you so much for those of you that are part of Ecclesia that come here on a regular basis, whether you're a member or not a member, it doesn't matter to me. I appreciate your smiling faces, and some of you that are not smiling, still appreciate you. Um, and from uh, my family to yours, Merry Christmas. We love you. We appreciate you. And uh, we would love to see you here next week as well. So let's pray, and then we're going to sing Silent Night together. And we'd love for you to stand up with us.